Hello from Washington, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Shihoko Goto, Director for Geoeconomics and Indo-Pacific Enterprise and Deputy Director of the Asia Program with the Woodrow Wilson Center. For those of you logging into a Wilson Center event for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. The Wilson Center was established in 1968 as an act of Congress dedicated to bridging the world of ideas and thought leadership with the world of policymaking. We remain a staunchly nonpartisan institution, and we are committed to being at the forefront of providing actionable ideas for global challenges. And one of the biggest challenges we face today is securing energy that is sustainable, cost-effective, and resilient to geopolitical risks. Today, we'll be focusing on energy security and prospects for cooperation between the United States and Japan bilaterally and in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. The pandemic, of course, has made all too clear some of the structural vulnerabilities facing the global economy and energy markets in particular. But it is the Russian invasion of Ukraine that has highlighted not only the disruptions that can be caused by geopolitical upheaval, but also the risks in depending upon authoritarian regimes for energy needs, given the possibility that they could weaponize their energy assets. The need for like-minded countries to work together to ensure that their energy resources are secure in the near term, and the need to future energy needs that are not only sustainable, but also resilient to geopolitical risks have become all too apparent. Japan and the United States have already been stepping up efforts to cooperate on a number of key challenges both countries are facing, including on the energy front. For instance, we've seen a push for greater bilateral cooperation on clean energy and decarbonization efforts as outlined in the latest comp uh, competitiveness and resilience with core partnership. This was released following the summit meeting between Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden in May. More recently, at the Joint Economic Consultative Meeting, better known as the Economic 2 plus 2 meeting, highlighted economic insecurity, energy insecurity, as an area for bilateral coordination to address immediate challenges of disruptions caused by Russian aggression and addressing the longer term challenges of energy transition and decarbonization. So what are the specific areas for cooperation to enhance energy security? How can the two countries reconcile the inevitable competition in developing new sources of energy? What is the prospect of public private partnership? How can the United States and Japan work together to ensure that global growth doesn't lose steam, even as emerging markets face increasing pressure to meet the needs of energy sustainability? There are many questions, and I am honored to be joined by some of the leading experts in the energy field in Japan and in the United States. I'm excited to introduce Tatsuya Terazawa, Chairman and CEO of the Institute of Energy Economics, who is joining us today from Tokyo. Before assuming his current position with the IEE, President Terazawa served in the Japanese government in a number of capacities, including as Special Advisor on Economic Security to the Cabinet Secretariat's National Security Secretariat, and he was also Vice Minister for International Affairs at the Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, better known as METI. Also joining from Japan is Professor Yukari Takamura, who is Vice President of the Science Council of Japan and Professor at the Institute for Future Initiatives at the University of Tokyo. The Institute was created in 2019 with the mission to promote and achieve sustainable development goals and also acts as a platform for collaboration between industries, government, and researchers. I'm also delighted to be joined by Sherry Goodman, 
a senior fellow with the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program, as well as the Center's Polar Institute. Uh, she is a former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security, and she established the first environmental safety and health program performance metrics for the Department of Defense, which apparently is the largest energy user in the United States. And she led the DOD's energy, environmental, and natural resource conservation programs. And finally, I am happy that we are joined by Robert McNally, founder and president of the Rapidan Energy Group that provides risk analysis and insight into global energy markets. Bob is also the author of Crude Volatility, The History and Future of Boom-Bust Oil Prices, published by Columbia University Press. And he is a former direct, senior director for international energy with the National Security Council. Before we begin today's discussion, I would like to remind viewers uh, that we will be taking questions from the audience today via email and Twitter. You can email us at asiaprogram at wilsoncenter.org, or you can tweet us at asiaprogram. Again, the email is asia at wilsoncenter.org, and our Twitter uh, handle is at asiaprogram. So with that, let me first turn to Tirazawa-san. Um, why are we having this focus, really, on energy security? What is Japan's longer-term vision to develop new energy sources uh, to ensure that not only its own national needs are met, but also the needs of the world, especially in the Indo-Pacific, which is the world's most dynamic and populous region? Okay, well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it is my great honor to be able to participate in this panel discussion. Well, let me start with the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, the war in Ukraine has exposed our vulnerabilities. We have been dependent too much on Russian energies, in particular, natural gas and LNG. So it is quite clear that we should reduce our dependence on Russian energy, in particular, natural gas and LNG. Otherwise, uh, President Putin can continue to weaponize his energy against us. But this is not easy. Uh, before the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia was the number one exporter of natural gas and LNG. And in fact, Russia was su supplying 25% of the global export market. And to make the matter worse, uh, before even before the war in Ukraine, uh, the world had very little spare capacity for natural gas or LNG. So logically, in order to reduce our dependence on Russian natural gas and LNG, we have to expand uh, not the non-Russian sources of LNG and natural gas. The question is, where do we get that natural gas or LNG from? There are two options. One option is Qatar. Qatar is rich in natural gas, uh, but unfortunately, uh, Qatar is located in the Middle East. And the location in the Middle East poses a potential uh, challenges uh, from the energy security uh, point of view. The next option is the USA. USA has so much potential for expanded supply of natural gas and LNG, and the US does not have the uh, energy security concerns that we may have uh, for Middle East, and the US is a reliable supplier uh, for energy. So I think it is very important that uh, the US can expand its LNG exporting capability to help the world reduce our dependence on Russian natural gas and LNG. How can Japan cooperate? Japan was the pioneer in the expansion of the introduction of LNG. The first LNG cargo arrived in Japan in 1969. Since then, Japan has been the leader in the LNG market. In fact, until 2020, 2020 Japan was the number one importer of LNG. So with such a long history dealing with LNG, uh, we have substantial uh, LNG-related technology, uh, which we can provide in our efforts to expand the LNG exporting capacity from the US, and we can also provide the finance. So this is the first area for cooperation between the US and Japan. Uh, but there's another challenge. 
that if we expand the LNG export uh, capability, there has to be a market. And for the time being, uh, the Europeans will be very eager to procure uh, US LNG because they would have to make the switch from Russian gas to US LNG. But Europe is pushing for energy efficiency and they're pushing for renewable energies. So over time, the demand from Europe for US LNG would be declining uh, over years. So we will need to have uh, another market to complement the European market. And that is the reason why uh, we attach great importance to Asia. Asia is the growth center of the world. They're fast growing. Uh, their demand for energy is growing rapidly. But at the same time, they would have to reduce their CO2 emission. And one of their pillars of strategy to reduce a CO2 emission is by making the switch from coal to gas. So it would be very helpful for the Asian uh, friends uh, to expand their LNG or gas uh, related infrastructure to support their strong economic growth while reducing their CO2 emission. But in order to realize this, Asia would require the necessary technology and the finance to realize this objective. In this regard, the US and Japan can cooperate to support uh, Asia uh, to make this kind of uh, transition. But there's another challenge, the third challenge. Both the US and Japan and many other countries share the long-term goal to realize carbon neutrality. So eventually we would have to deal with the CO2 to be emitted from natural gas or LNG. And this is the reason why uh, we attach great importance and interest for hydrogen. When you, when you go back to chemistry that all of us learned in the high school or junior high school, if we burn hydrogen, we only produce water, no CO2. So it's very good for the environment. Hydrogen can be co-fired with the natural gas using the uh, gas-fired power plants to reduce the CO2 emission from the existing gas-fired power plants. And eventually 100% burning of uh, LNG uh, would be possible. Additionally, hydrogen can be used to produce the high temperature heat that is absolutely necessary for the industrial use. Currently, in most cases, in many cases, uh, LNG or natural gas are used to produce that high temperature heat, but we can make the switch from natural gas to hydrogen to produce the high heat, uh, uh, high temperature heat. And this is very important to decarbonize the hard to abate sectors, such as the industry and transportation. The next question is then how, how can we produce hydrogen? One way is to produce hydrogen from water. Produce hydrogen from water, burn hydrogen and get water back, it's sort of a cycle. Um, to produce a hydrogen from water, we would have to have electrolyzer and also uh, power, electricity power to make uh, hydrogen out from water. And if we can utilize renewable energies to provide the power to, uh, to, to this process of electrolysis, we can completely have a zero carbon hydrogen. And this is called a green hydrogen. Um, so this is excellent in terms of environment point of view, but the problem is that we expect that for the foreseeable future, it will be very expensive uh, to produce green hydrogen. The other problem is that this would require abundance of renewable energies. Um, but unfortunately, as of now, renewable energies are used for other, use, uh, other, other uh, usage. So we do not have the um, luxury of using renewable energies to produce hydrogen yet. So in the future, uh, green energy, green hydrogen would be a great option, but what can we do in, in the meantime? This will lead us to the next uh, production uh, uh, method, which is to produce hydrogen from natural gas. Uh, but the problem is that CO2 will come out in this process of producing hydrogen from natural gas. But the CO2 can be captured and stored underground using the CCS technology. Through this process, we can uh, decarbonize uh, to produce low carbon hydrogen. This is called blue hydrogen. Uh, the benefit of blue hydrogen is that 
uh, it is considered to be less expensive compared uh, to the uh, green hydrogen for the time being. And we can produce a uh, blue hydrogen in scale. The US can be an excellent supplier of blue hydrogen. The US has so much uh, potential uh, in terms of the supply of natural gas. And the US has so many good locations for CCS. So the US can be an excellent supplier for blue hydrogen. And the US can make a great contribution to help us reach the, our common goal of carbon neutrality. The US can also benefit by using its existing uh, gas infrastructure, like pipelines and other infrastructure. And by producing blue hydrogen from natural gas, uh, the US can maintain jobs and help local communities uh, which are currently producing natural gas. What about Japan? Japan is the global leader in the hydrogen related technologies. Japan can develop uh, the necessary technologies to produce, transport, store, and use uh, hydrogen. Japan can help expand markets for US produced uh, hydrogen and to realize carbon neutrality for Japan and for Asia. To summarize, um, there are three uh, areas of cooperation between the US and Japan. The first, the US and Japan can cooperate uh, in developing and expanding the non-Russian source of LNG natural gas uh, from the US through LNG. The second area is that we can cooperate in developing markets for US LNG in Asia to help Asia reduce its CO2 emission while supporting their strong economic growth. The third area of cooperation is hydrogen. We can cooperate in developing the necessary technologies for hydrogen, and we can cooperate in expecting the markets for US hydrogen. I shall stop here for my initial comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive overview on some of the challenges and opportunities um, for both Japan itself and US-Japan relations. Um, let me now turn to Sherry. Um, there is obviously greater urgency uh, for the world to be able to reconcile immediate energy needs and meet um, its longer term energy security goals. Are the United States and Japan seeing eye to eye when it comes to climate commitments um, and the sustainable energy? And where are the biggest opportunities for bilateral cooperation um, in energy transition? Well, thank you very much, Ihoko. And it's a, a pleasure and a deep honor to be here uh, with my Japanese colleagues. I, I first became familiar with the the Japanese energy industry in the 1980s um, when I was serving on the Senate Armed Services Committee staff and visited a number of your nuclear power plants at that time. So I have uh, long been engaged with um, our Japanese colleagues on US-Japan energy cooperation. And I believe our en the enduring nature of our relationship is so vitally important and our pillars of uh, democracy and upholding the rules-based order is ever more essential. As today, I believe we face really a triple threat um, when it comes to the challenges ahead. And um, you know, we, we first discussed the, the first threat, uh, as you outlined so well, uh, my colleague, is you know, Putin's war on Ukraine, which has uh, affected energy security and Ukrainian lives and threatened uh, peace, order, and stability, not only in Europe, but around the world. Um, and, you know, the second is, of course, China's growing global influence um, and efforts around the world, which affects everything, including the topic of energy security we're discussing today, as well as climate. And third is the climate threat, which we all face, and that urgency, uh, which I've characterized uh, for many years now as a threat multiplier, um, becomes ever more clear with each passing heat wave, fire, and flood that our countries have faced. So the urgency uh, is clear. Our ability to adapt and become resilient and to make this energy transition in order to avoid the worsening effects uh, of climate change is yet unclear. But I, I believe in the commitment 
that our two nations have together and has outlined so well about how we can begin to accelerate through this transition, both to meet urgent current needs uh, for natural gas, um, particularly as we begin to decarbonize it through the grow growing the hydrogen uh, fuel cycle and hydrogen supply chains. Um, so let's, um, I, I wanna focus on some areas of particular cooperation among our nations and in the context uh, of what I think is also a very promising um, Quad Alliance, where the U.S., uh, Japan, uh, Australia, and India have really committed uh, in their climate efforts to climate ambition, clean energy, uh, and adaptation and resilience. And I'll just observe that I, I think that the U.S. now is in a slightly better place today to deliver on its climate commitments as we come ever closer to passing the new Inflation Reduction Act. Of course, the commitments on hydrogen that you discussed um, uh, uh, Tara Zawazan, in your in your last remarks, are already embedded in the in the bipartisan. Some of that is already funded through the bipartisan infrastructure bill. But now we have an infusion of a potentially additional almost four hundred billion dollars of funding um, to accelerate clean energy and climate commitments, uh, among others. So that will help us uh, move closer to meeting our Paris climate agreements and to also really beginning to turn the corner on, uh, on those energy transition efforts. So let's talk about uh, what, what some of those are. And you began really the work on sort of expanding the natural gas flows, uh, LNG flows uh, to Asia, being mindful that um, not only Europe is making the transition to more efficiency and more renewables, but the rest of the world needs to do that. And the US and Japan are also on the path to do that. I note uh, very promisingly that the US and Japan have committed in there. So the US and Japan have a very important clean energy and energy security initiative. Um, and I'm gonna talk about sort of three elements of it. And I'll start where um, our first speaker left off, which is on hydrogen, which is the important commitment uh, to reduce the cost down to $1 per kilo in one decade, one, one, one. Um, and that, that commitment um, is very important because Japan is a leader in hydrogen supply chains. And um, that is going to help us really be able to scale up and make the transition first into blue hydrogen, as you say, using CCS, and eventually into green hydrogen, um, which is going to be ultimately important with by being able to insert more renewables. And so the second area of cooperation among our nations is on renewable energy, tech, and grid integration. There's a lot of work going on offshore wind. Both our countries have prodigious sources of offshore wind and are beginning to use that and diversify in the ways in which, in the sectors of the economy in which it's used. I'd also note that uh, we have a promising cooperation on geothermal and the US and Japan are among the top three geothermal um, uh, sources of energy in the world. So that is going to be increasingly important as we, as we tap that a very clean source of energy in uh, geologies where it's available in our two countries. So, um, uh, there are many technical issues there, but I, you know, we have overcome many technical challenges in the past, and that leads, I think, into our third area of potential cooperation, which is on nuclear, because we cannot move to a decarbonized world uh, without uh, relooking at nuclear power. And importantly, very important for global geostrategic interests, we cannot cede the civilian nuclear energy industry to Russia and China. That would be greatly uh, to the disadvantage and um, jeopardize secure, our security, our non-proliferation goals on nuclear around the world. And what's happened unfortunately over the last decade or so is the US has lost ground um, in that civilian nuclear export industry. But there are many new nuclear technologies recognizing the challenges we've had and very mindful of the painful uh, past uh, between Fukushima and other nuclear incidents, 
Um, but the new generation of nuclear powered small modular and micro reactors um, is going to be very important. Uh, the technical work to build a strong regulatory case for extending life of, of, of existing nuclear power plants, and then the investments um, that are being made both through Japan with the US, um, with some of the innovators through Bill Gates uh, company, Terra Power, and others to develop that next generation of nuclear power. And the US is, is poised to um, demonstrate and test some of that in some of our remote locations, including um, military bases in Alaska um, and other locations. And I think that's going to be um, a very important, increasingly important part of our future as it's secure and safe and we uh, learn to deal uh, with, the, with the waste streams. So that is an, is an important element. Then uh, I'll just close by saying, I think that continued and part of becoming energy secure is also becoming climate resilient because our major, our ports, our facilities, our pipelines, our energy critical infrastructure also uh, is subject to climate risks from typhoons, from hurricanes, from floods, from sea level rise. So increasingly our collaboration on improving the resilience of our infrastructure, and we have a whole set of initiatives in that area, which I won't go into in great depth now, but with the great engineering expertise between our two nations, we are really working, I think, to develop some of the improved techniques and also to work at, at um, decarbonizing key elements of that from decarbonized cement and steel that will be critical to secure um, better, better clean infrastructure to support uh, the new energy transition. And finally, I'll, I'll note, of course, critical materials uh, are very important and we need to look together at how we uh, friendshore that supply chain and how we make it uh, more secure in our future. So thank you and it's a pleasure um, to be with you all this morning. Great, Th thank you, Sherry. You've provided a lot of materials for us to um, discuss moving forward. And I know I certainly want to hear more about uh, the nuclear um, uh, nuclear energy. Um, I also hope we can talk a little bit about infrastructure development as well. But uh, before we do that, um, I'd like to now turn to uh, Professor Takamura. Um, the need, of course, to mitigate geopolitical risks in the energy markets um, and address longer term energy security needs has really become quite clear. We need to discuss bold ideas, some of which have already been outlined, but it's also a costly um, endeavor at a time when governments are dealing with tremendous fiscal pressure. Um, and there's also Japan and the United States are also democracies that need to be accountable to voters and public opinion. Um, how can the costs of ambitious energy transition projects be funded within Japan? Um, and what is the role of the private sector in ensuring that climate goals are met? So thank, thank you. Thank you, Shihoko-san. And also it's really great pleasure and honor of me to be a panelist among the such outstanding speakers. But um, I, I think they much already have uh, told by Terasawa-san, but I, I, I also the, uh, highlight the couple points, especially from the Japanese perspective and uh, in the context of decarbonization, uh, that means that the, the climate change. So the uh, actually the Russian invasion on Ukraine uh, impact have impacted also Japan. Um, you know the share of the imported fossil fuel from Russia uh, relatively low, uh, as you might know that the the uh, you know the in term of oil it's a four percent and. Uh, uh, Natural gas at nine percent, and the coal and the eleven percent, uh, you know, relatively low, relatively low, uh, you know, the compared to the sum of the European countries. But still, the the impact from the Russian invasion in Ukraine uh, is the surge in price of the energy. 
So the, uh, as you know, that around 90% of prime energy consumption are from imported fossil fuel, fuel in case of Japan, which is highly depending on the imported fossil fuel. That show the, the as it has us an, uh, already told, that the uh, vulnerability of Japanese uh, energy system in terms of the energy security. What I like to highlight uh, as, a uh, as a first point is that decarbonization of energy sector is of course the essential for uh, achieving climate neutrality and uh, you know the to protect the climate, our climate, but decarbonization of energy sector is actually uh, 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 is essential for enhancing the energy security of Japan. So as I already told that the uh, uh, we our energy system is highly dependent and actually in terms of CO2 emission is the, the uh, CO2 emission from energy use accounts for the about 50, 85 of percent of Japanese greenhouse gas emissions. So the what should we do uh, in the context of the such energy crisis uh, that Japan faced? I, I think it's quite similar to other countries, including United States. We need definitely two key policy direction with a different time horizon. For, for, for short time basis, uh, diversification of energy uh, source and uh, uh, ensuring how to uh, energy supply that we need as uh, one of the collaborative areas, uh, you know, the among the United States and Japan. Um, we need definitely the accelerate existing technology to reduce the emission and reduce energy uh, demand as much as possible. So then in that context, I, I, I'm going to talk about the, the maybe the uh, area that we need to collaborate as, as Sherry suggested that one is renewable and also the, the uh, you know, energy efficiency uh, technologies. Um, the second key policy direction with different time angle is the, the how to decarbonize our you know, energy system uh, in long-term perspective toward net zero uh, by 2050. That is a shared goal uh, among uh, United States and Japan with the other developed countries. So uh, for for doing so, we need definitely the 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 uh, uh, you know the big transition or, or transformation uh, uh, of society. At the same time, the we need the R and D for developing new technology and new solution. So the I I, I I'm going to talk about first the 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 uh, you know the. Uh, short-term collaboration among the United States and Japan, two countries. Uh, as I already said, I, I think quite uh, my, my view is actually shared well, the quite similar to Sherry. Uh, I know one is renewable, uh, you know, the, that is the maximizing energy and efficiency and the maximum deployment of renewable. That definitely strengthens the energy security. If we look at some data, for instance, from the uh, uh, arena, uh, you know, the still the Japan and the United States have faced some challenge to reduce in the cost of renewable. That is, I think, the one of the area uh, to be collaborated among two countries. And of course, new gen uh, development and technology, uh, new, new development of the new generation of the renewable, uh, such as uh, of uh, floating uh, offshore wind. That is, I, I think, the, the, the quite a promising area to collabor for collaboration. If I could add to the, in the, uh, the some other possibility is that the, how to ensure the integration of the variable renewable energy into grid and uh, to reduce its cost. 
So for, for that purpose, energy storage technologies, of course, including battery, but also the hydrogen and new green fuel could be uh, one of the area uh, for the collaboration. And of course, uh, uh, the, the strategic and critical materials such as cobalt and retum for green technology, how to ensure the supply of these um, material is quite important. Of course, the, the accelerate innovation for their alternatives. For, for doing so, the, the, I'd like to highlight how much the private sector is the, the strong end the some area of the the uh, uh, these technology. For instance, the one of the area is renewable and the fuel cells. Uh, uh, if I look at the the uh, the data from the WIPO and the Japan and the US in the top one and two, uh, you know, the to create a new patent and uh, uh, especially the, in the area of solar and the fuel cells. So the, the, the maybe how to uh, accelerate, how to release the, the potential of the private sector uh, to uh, you know, the, uh, uh, make a new solution in this area is the, the a, 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 a one of the area, promising area for collaboration. Now the company are quite keen to make them transition toward net zero because they're facing the evaluation by the financial sector. So the, the, I think that some kind of collaboration and acceleration of their action through the public policy is necessary. I think one, one, one of the quite important uh, you know, initiative for, for that purpose is the Fast Movers Coalition to provide the, the incentive to uh, you know, the company which wish wishing to the investing in the the uh, new uh, solution uh, for decarbonization energy sector uh, collaborate together with the the some kind of the the uh, 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 company and the public sector who wish to see the realization of such collaboration uh, such kind of public and private collaboration is. I think it's quite critical. That last not least, I think everyone talk, my, my talk, that's the one of the very important, uh, you know, the area is Asia and the Indo, uh, India Pacific, in the Pacific region, because the Asia, for instance, account for the more than 40% of greenhouse gas emission of global globe and uh, uh, in terms of climate. That is quite critical, and also the uh, you know size of market uh, through the 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 uh, decarbonizing uh, uh, technology. Uh, I, I think it's also very much promising. But if I could add to two element, two reason to highlight the the importance of the Asian and the Indo Pacific region is that the. Uh, uh, some uh, the, the the region is somehow depending on the fossil fuel, uh, sometimes imported from Russia, and then the the how to decarbonize the the, the area or region is uh, also the essential uh, for the national security for both countries. For that reason, uh, I really would like to talk uh, uh, to discuss on this issue uh, with the panelists. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, um, Professor Takamono, for this incredibly insightful comments. And I know um, that we really do want to talk about um, energy security as national security um, over the course of this discussion too. But um, I'm going to now turn to Bob McNally, who's been patiently waiting. But before I ask him um, about um, you know, some of the opportunities and risks uh, that are emerging as amid this new um, energy security reality, um, I would like to remind our viewers that we are taking questions. Uh, you can email us 
Um, the email address is asia at wilsoncenter.org. Again, that's asia at wilsoncenter.org. You can also tweet us at Asia Program. Um, so we hope to hear from you. Uh, so, wow, let me um, turn, turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Yohoko. And uh, thank you, uh, the Wilson Center, for, for inviting me to be on this very distinguished panel. Uh, for a well-rounded conversation about an issue that's also been very important to me through my career, uh, energy, but really the U.S.-Japan energy relationship, which I think uh, is uh, not only glorious and fantastic, uh, but as great things to come. I'm very op optimistic about it, as I'll describe shortly. I was hoping maybe to step back and put our relationship in a broader trend of energy markets, but also geopolitics. I'll start with the good news. Uh, the good news is, uh, thank God, the United States has become a true arsenal of energy, a term I coined in 2014, and I'm so proud of that our country has been able to uh, not only become uh, a sort of a net exporter in, in oil, um, but a great exporter to our allies like Japan. Some quick numbers. From almost nothing in 2015, um, our natural gas exports uh, went up to 11.7 uh, BCF a day in March of 2022. And we're supposed to get to 13 and a half BCF a day by the end of 2023. Japan gets 10% of our exports and its, import, and our, its imports from the United States have increased sevenfold over the last few years. And as Terazawa-san said, uh, we are hopefully gonna be able and willing to step up and provide even more uh, after uh, Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine and the pinch that's putting on global LNG supplies as Japan thinks about where it's going to source LNG going forward. Oil. Oil exports crude was largely banned until 2015, uh, and now it's close to a record high of about three and a half million barrels a day. Uh, refined products were never banned, but they've tripled since 2005. Uh, Japan, which imports, as you know, all of its oil, uh, more or less, uh, saw its imports from the United States rise from about 150,000 barrels a day in 2015 to 500,000 barrels a day in 2021. So the U.S.-Japan energy trade is a great example of how, frankly, an unexpected, few saw this coming many years ago, but an unexpected development um, were enabled us to provide Japan with a geopolitically secure, friendly, uh, even allied source of critical energy, recalling that Hydrocarbon energy accounts for 80% of the energy we use in the world and is critical to modern living standards um, and, uh, and national security. Okay, why were we able to do this? One, two reasons. One, the US oil and gas industry was figured out how to unlock shale resources, both oil and gas. And two, there was political will to allow that production and allow that exports. Now we're gonna get into some of the more challenges that we, we face. We cannot take either for granted uh, going forward. We've just emerged from a seven year bust phase in oil prices, which is making investors cautious about investing in new oil. And there are political challenges to exporting oil and gas that we've seen crop over, over the last years, uh, over the last year or so. And broader, uh, there's a concern that in the name of decarbonization, uh, we're seeing some governments and international agencies like the IEA sort of adopt a sort of a maximalist sort of peak supply approach, which says we must immediately ban all new investment in greenfield oil and gas projects. And, uh, and, and so I think this, uh, these developments pose a challenge to us as we see if we can continue this trend of, of meeting our energy security, of, of being a great trading partner of Japan, providing uh, oil and gas exports uh, to our allies. Um, so I think uh, finally, uh, another critical issue, we haven't talked much about oil, but oil is still sort of important. It still dominates every, almost every vehicle on the planet. And however fast we get into electric vehicles, we'll be driving uh, and flying mostly on oil. Uh, and uh, uh, Japan, of course, is, uh, is a huge importer and gets most of its oil from the Middle East. I think a question that arises now is whether the Carter Doctrine and the Reagan Corollary uh, still are relevant in global energy and security. This matters importantly for Japan, given the flow of oil from the Middle East to Japan and the st its dependence on price stability. The Carter Doctrine said, the United States will defend our Gulf allies <clears throat> against external powers. The Reagan corollary said, the United States will defend our ga gas allies against regional adversaries, uh, thinking then of Iraq and then Iran. Now, back then when President Carter inaugurated this um, during an energy crisis. Um, 
we were a large net importer and we and our Gulf partners wanted to keep the Soviet Union out. We agreed on that. Now, the United States is a net exporter. China has replaced the Soviet Union as the main adversary and many Gulf producers wanna welcome China in. And so the role of the Gulf in uh, the US-China uh, conflict, and really it's not just China, but US, Japan, South Korea, our allies, is something that's very important and needs a lot of attention and focus and is an area where the United States and Japan, we're gonna to have to work together on to address that risk. So um, you have, uh, I think, three challenges the US-Japan relationship is dealing with. One is the, uh, again, this boom cycle in oil prices. We, since 2014 till late last year, we had a oversupply of oil, prices were very low, uh, but we're, we're entering a, a multi-year boom phase uh, where the, we've invested too little, demand hasn't been really curtailed, and we're gonna see steadily rising hot oil prices. This is a challenge uh, for uh, Japan as an importer of energy. Uh, it's also uh, gonna be a challenge for China to some degree, because uh, their costs will go up, but it's a challenge we have to deal with. Um, and then there are these uh, shifting uh, politics with regard to the Gulf. And finally, how do we balance the need to decarbonize with the need to be pragmatic and reasonable and uh, objective with how we um, implement our policies, right? Uh, abrupt curtailments of oil and gas cause revolutions and, uh, and riots and, and unrest and threaten to upend geopolitical stability. We've seen over the last year, uh, governments with some of the most progressive climate change policies are moving the fastest to subsidize oil and gas consumption in the face of high oil prices and gas prices, Germany, Italy, the state of New York, and others. So we've had in the last year a sort of a rude awakening and a reminder that as we think about how the pace of decarbonization, we ought to think about the need to secure adequate forms of the dominant energy, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, in, the, in the coming year. Finally, I'll end on some good no news because we started with some good news. We had some challenges and I want to end it on a high point. I think US and Japan, are uniquely suited to address some of the challenges emanating from these shifts I described. Uh, things like um, improving our organization and use of strategic petroleum reserves. We should not be draining those things down. Uh, we should be building them up. Ensuring that the International Energy Agency and other multilateral agencies that provide the data, the analysis, and in some cases funding for energy projects in the developing world, ensuring that they are making decisions based on objective analysis, pragmatism, and realism, as well as policy objectives from an energy security and environmental standpoint. The US and Japan, if we cooperate, given our size in those agencies, we can do great things. So, uh, and then uh, Sherry mentioned nuclear, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Tarazawa-san mentioned uh, hydrogen, ammonia, other areas we can cooperate. So I'm actually very optimistic. It's almost required that US and Japan renew and strengthen their energy cooperation, building on successes and meet the challenge that are coming. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the Q&A. Great. Um, thank you so much, Bob, um, for reminding us about the um, geopolitical risks that um, have been systemic and some of the challenges that the world has faced over the decades. Um, really, to um, expand on that, I want to go back to this idea about the opportunities and challenges um, in meeting the needs of the Indo-Pacific more broadly. So we have those um, dual challenges of, on the one hand, moving towards decarbonization, but on the other hand, in, in the global south and the emerging markets, there is this great need for secure and stable energy right now. Um, we've seen the G7 come up with an infrastructure initiative, um, of which some is earmarked for energy security, I'm hoping, um, perhaps Terazawa-san in particular, um, but I also want to hear from others, um, what are the prospects um, for ensuring that the, the Indo-Pacific can actually move forward um, economically um, with the secure and stable energy source and, and the role that Japan and the United States can play for that? Well, thank you very much. I already touched upon the importance of uh of LNG and also hydrogen uh, to serve the uh, needs of the Indo-Pacific. I would add maybe two more aspects. 
Uh, one is that one point is that we have to look at the difference between Asia or Indo Pacific with, uh, for example, Europe. Um, Asia is fast growing, population is growing, and they have a strong aspiration to raise their living standards, which would lead to a dramatic increase in their energy demand. And we expect that uh, for ASEAN, we expect the energy demand to more than double uh, between 2017 and 2040. And also, uh, Asia has a very young fleet of coal-fired power plants. 60% of them are less than 60 years old. These are very different from Europe. Uh, for Europe, um, they have a modest economic growth. The population is not growing. And uh, they already have a high living standard. And they are pushing for energy efficiency. So the energy demand in Europe is decreasing. And their fleet of coal-fired power plants are very old. So it's quite easy for the Europeans to say that they will retire their coal-fired power plants early. But that's not the same for many countries in the Indo-Pacific region. They would have to continue using their coal-fired power plants. But the challenge is how to let them continue using their coal-fired power plants, but at the same time reducing the CO2 emission. And that's where um, ammonia would kick in. Ammonia can be produced from hydrogen. Uh, if you burn ammonia, uh, it doesn't produce CO2. Uh, the beauty of ammonia is that it is easier to transport. Um, in the absence of pipelines, you would have to liquefy hydrogen. But to liquefy hydrogen, you have to cool it down below minus 253 degrees Celsius. But for ammonia, you only have to cool it down to minus 33 degrees Celsius. So uh, to transport um, hydrogen, uh, it is better to use uh, uh, ammonia as a carrier. And ammonia can be used to be coal-fired with coal to reduce the CO2 emission from the coal-fired power plants while providing the energy supply for that region. So that's the reason that I am highlighting uh, ammonia. And that will be another aspect in addition to LNG and hydrogen that we can cooperate uh, to support Asia. And by the way, the US can be an excellent supplier of ammonia using the natural gas produced from the US. The second point is that um, Indo-Pacific is a region uh, very strong in manufacturing. Uh, they are the core of the global supply chains. Um, one of the challenge is that if, as, as uh, Robert and uh, uh, Takamura uh, Sensei and Sherry have pointed out that, uh, critical minerals will be important. The reason is that as we accelerate our shift towards uh, renewable energies, having more batteries, having more EVs, there will be a dramatic uh, expansion of the demand for uh, critical minerals and materials. So we have to develop this supply capacity to meet that demand, but also we have to pay close attention to the fact that we are dependent on a single supply year for these critical minerals and materials. So uh, today I have been focusing on energy security and I have been focusing on over-dependence on Russia. But our push for uh, clean energy will not resolve all the energy security uh, challenges. It will lead to another emerging uh, energy security challenge. And so before it's too late, I think the US and Japan would have to cooperate in enhancing our resilience for the supply chain for the critical minerals and materials that require our cooperation and development uh, uh, of technologies to reduce the use, develop alternatives, and, uh, and develop uh, different suppliers, diversified suppliers for this. And we may have a stockpile. Uh, we may engage in recycling. But these really resilience will not only help the US and Japan, but also would help many countries in the Indo-Pacific which are core parts of the uh, manufacturing sector for the world. So these are the challenges uh, the Indo-Pacific region faces. And the US and Japan are in a very good position. And we, I think we have a responsibility uh, to provide the uh, ammonia and also uh, resilient supply chain for critical minerals. Uh, thank you very much for that. I don't know if anyone has, um, oh, Sherry. Well, I I those are all excellent comments. And uh, I agree that as we move through the energy transition, we move from oil towards, well, coal, cleaner coal, decarbonized coal, no coal eventually. Um, 
and then oil to natural gas and low carbon decarbonized uh, natural gas, particularly with methane abatement, which I think is another area of important cooperation between our two countries on ensuring appropriate methane abatement. And, and, as, you rec and as you pointed out, uh, Tarazan, as we move into more renewables, we've got the challenge of the critical materials. Uh, to Takamura-san also mentioned that. And I would also observe our commitment together, US, Japan, and in the Quad Alliance, both to diversify that supply chain on critical min, min, uh, materials and critical minerals, and to minimize the use where possible. Because we shouldn't forget that efficiency is always the fourth fuel here, and it's always underappreciated. And the extent to which we can, min I mean, we need them, but we can also look at ways to be more efficient in their use, and we are doing that now, I, you know, together in our solar and battery supply chains, and looking to source more sustainably all elements uh, of that clean energy supply chain. And the other area I would note that I think the U.S. and Japan, as manufacturing powerhouses, have and, and recognizing the importance in the Asia Pacific region overall, the ability to um, test and demonstrate and to scale up in ways that help bring down costs in many of these sectors. And that's where we're working together. And Takamura-san, I noted, you know, you observe particularly the private, the private sector's role here, which is so fundamental, particularly, you know, in all in the sectors that require large capital costs, you know, in nuclear, in uh, hydrogen, in ammonia, in all these areas of infrastructure where we need large investment. You know, I would note that JBIC's been a really important investor in many of these areas, and that's important. You know, our own U.S. Exim Bank is working to step up its uh, capabilities here um, as well. But I think that, along with many of our key uh, um, companies that are part of the First Movers Coalition, looking at sustainable aviation fuels, sustainable maritime fuels, clean uh, cement and steel, decarbonized cement and steel, and the other se eight sectors in that first movers coalition where the, U the US and Japan are so critical, uh, that leadership is, is very fundamental uh, along with our government. And I would also note too, our, at the subnational level too, we have a lot of leadership you know, in the US states now as well. Um, and, and they're really stepping out from you know, California to New York to Washington State working um, with many uh, of your companies and other sectors of society. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me turn to this issue of hydrogen. Um, we spent a lot of time today already talking about geopolitical risks and um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in particular, we have not actually talked ab about str strategic competition. We haven't mentioned China. And yet China, the Chinese government has released its first long-term plan for hydrogen, uh, which covers the period from 2021 to 2035. And they're looking to develop a domestic hydrogen industry. Um, and boost man, um, manufacturing capabilities. What is, um, how do we see that relationship um, of, of China building its own hydrogen ecosystem? Is that going to be compatible? What are the, re, uh, what kind of relationship can Japan and the United States have with China and its hydrogen ambitions? Um, I am going to um, turn again, perhaps to Terasa-san and also if Takamura-san, um, as well as Bob can chime in, I think that would be great. Well, um, a, a tough question, <laughs> but um, I, I think we, if we look back uh, to the history of many uh, renewable energies, I, I think we should uh, learn a lesson from that process. Uh, for example, uh, for solar panel, um, Japan, at least at one point, led the world in technology innovation. And Japanese companies were the main suppliers of solar panels uh, at some point. But now um, the solar panel supply is dominated by, by China. So uh, this can ha happen, can be repeated in many areas of, of, uh, of, uh, of this trans energy transition 
it could happen with uh, wind power. Uh, currently, the Europeans are ahead, but uh, China is in investing heavily in wind power generation. So the same story we went through with a solar panel can take place in wind power generation. It can take place with hydrogen as well. Um, and um, I think we have learned a lesson from uh, the war in Ukraine that over-dependence on a single supplier, um, putting aside the intention, uh, the possibility or the dependence in itself uh, can be a potential uh, uh, energy security or national security uh, challenge. So it is important that while um, other countries like China may be pushing for uh, new types of energy, energies, it is important that we have alternative uh, credible sources of energy. And to make that happen, just having uh, innovation is not sufficient from our lessons from, from solar panels. We have to protect the IPR, intellectual property rights. And that is not uh, um, the end. I think Sherry uh, pointed out the importance of scale and that the scale has been the ultimate element um, that we have lost uh, in the competition. Uh, uh, in the absence of scale, uh, we would eventually lose the cost competitiveness. And um, uh, if a single country, a, uh, one country uh, enjoys the scale, uh, that country will enjoy cost, costing competitiveness and it will lead to more scale, leading to um, more cost competitiveness and leading to more scale. And this cycle is what happened in the solar panel. And it could happen in many fronts. So yes, we need to have technology innovation. Yes, we need to protect IPR, but we have to make sure that um, we need to have the scale uh, to ensure that we, we remain competitive. And that leads to the necessity that the countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific um, can co collaborate in the development and also ensuring the scale to provide alternatives. And that is the reason why, why the US and Japan should cooperate, but it's not just Japan and the US. Uh, combined the population of two countries, uh, we will have saying, like um, 400 million or 450 million population. Uh, that's not enough when you're competing with a country with more than 1 billion, possibly 1.4 billion population. So that's the reason why it is important to collaborate, not just between the US and Japan, but with countries which share the same concern uh, to, uh, to collaborate so that we continue to have alternative sources of, uh, of products and, uh, and materials uh, to help us uh, pursue our energy transition in a, in a matter consistent with our national security and energy security. If I could build on uh, Terazawa-san's comments and to say, I'm not very concerned that China is gonna dominate hydrogen. I think the fact that they're only now coming up with a strategy, I think underscores that they're a little late and they had bet the farm on vehicle electrification, battery electrification, and, uh, and to some degree polysilicon and so forth. But when they were doing this 10 to 15 years ago, I think there was, an, there was optimism that China would be integrated into the world economy, there would be no trade barriers, and there was less of a concern about China's coercive geopolitical behavior. So now I think in some ways the shift to hydrogen or the addition to hydrogen is a recognition that they will not be allowed to dominate the electric vehicle and uh, even uh, wind um, power supply chains. And so, the, and so the second reason I'm not too concerned is they don't really have access to the easy access to the most uh, scalable feedstock for hydrogen, which is natural gas. So uh, I don't think they'll be allowed to, um, you know, uh, secure the resources internationally. They're going to need gas for their power gen and their and their and their industrial uses and so forth. They're going to be a, a big importer of gas. Um, I don't see them having cheap feedstock for it. I think uh, the United States and Japan aren't going to be late to this race on hydrogen. If hydrogen proves to be a truly scalable, lower carbon uh, energy source, I'm pretty confident, given where we are in the trend I just described, we're not in 2012, given we are in 2023, with the mayhem and the risks going on right now, I think Japan, the United States, other countries will, would win a, a hydrogen race with China. Um, 
if I may, uh, uh, to add something, um, I think it, it, of course, the not only hydrogen and also the other uh, technologies such as ammonia as well, but uh, I think the the there are still a challenge about, for instance, cost reduction, and also how to scale up for the market and marketization. So for for doing so, maybe. Uh, one of the the uh, uh, important area for collaboration, how to uh, make a, a standard, uh, a clear standard for the private sectors, and also the together with the clear clear uh, the the long term direction, so that uh, ensure the the uh, you know the uh, investment from the long term perspective. And uh, investing in the new technologies. So, uh, uh, of course, the infrastructure for supply chain is the quite key. Uh, I think it's one of the the uh, area as well for the Asian region because the the uh, uh, to to deploy this technology for for this region. I, I think the. We need some kind of policy collaboration for the purpose. Thank you. Great. Um, can I add? Um, in my response to Bob, um, um, I, I think we have a good chance, uh, especially uh, since we have learned lessons, but we cannot um, be complacent and uh, we cannot underestimate uh, our competitor. Uh, for example, uh, if we talk about uh, green hydrogen, uh, the important fact will be how um, how cheap can we make the electrolysis, and uh, the scale uh, matters in this regard. And with the massive uh, investment um, in um, electrolyzers, um, a, a certain country with huge volume can lower the cost. And if that country has an installment of substantial renewable energy, uh, it can have a, a advantage in green uh, hydrogen. You're right, in terms of uh, blue hydrogen, uh, the US would have an advantage, but we would have to capitalize on that early advantage to make sure that we will be dominant or at least leading in hydrogen. Otherwise for green hydrogen, uh, there's no assurance uh, that um, uh, we can continue to be competitive. And uh, Takamura Sensei uh, mentioned the importance of standard. I think both the US and Japan have been very bad uh, in setting the global standard. U Europeans have been very good, uh, but recently uh, China has been very good in setting global standards. This is an area of weakness between the US and Japan. So this is certainly an area in which we have to, to cooperate. But in addition to standards, there are many fronts that we need to cooperate and we have to learn from the past lessons uh, without being too um, uh, desperate. Um, we, with very sound optimism, but we need to have concerted efforts uh, to make sure that we will not repeat uh, what happened in uh, solar panels and maybe happening in batteries. So we have to avoid that. Thank you um, for those really insightful comments. Um, Speaking of lessons to be learned, um, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, the outlook for nuclear power um, and the lessons to have been learned from the Fukushima uh, disaster and what Japan can offer in terms of um, what, where, how the world move forward, moves forward when it comes to nuclear energy. Is there a political and public appetite for nuclear energy now? Um, or is there and is there demand um, in the emerging markets? Um, if so, where where is the demand? If not, why not? Um, let me um, Sherry. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm I'm happy to defer to Terrazon. Why don't you go first? Oh, um, from the global perspective. I think there is a renewed interest in nuclear uh, for countries who are serious in realizing carbon neutrality. Uh, nuclear would have to be 
uh, one of the pieces to realize carbon neutrality. And uh, the French President Macron came to that conclusion even before the war in Ukraine. Uh, he made the announcement that uh, France will be starting uh, development of construction of new nuclear power plants back in November. But especially following uh, uh, President Putin's uh, invasion into Ukraine, uh, we are seeing a large number of countries making the decision to expand their nuclear capacity. UK has decided that they will construct eight new nuclear uh, units and increasing the share of nuclear in their power mix from 15% to 25%. And these uh, decisions are followed by mostly East European countries like Poland um, or, or Romania um, or other countries in the East European uh, area. The countries who had been dependent on Russian gas, uh, they are making their strategic choices uh, to develop uh, nuclear reactors to reduce their dependence on Russian energy. So there is a growing appetite, globally speaking, uh, for nuclear power. Then the question that would lead us to Japan, what's the situation in Japan? Um, frankly, um, the trauma uh, from the Fukushima accident is still uh, prevalent in Japan. Uh, it is a very divisive uh, issue in Japan. But uh, if I may separate of the two aspects of nuclear, what we do with the existing nuclear power units and what we do about developing or constructing new nuclear units. As for the uh, usage of existing nuclear uh, units, I think there is a growing strong support for that. And Prime Minister Kisha mentioned several weeks ago that he, his, his direction uh, directive is to restart or re, uh, to put nine nuclear units in operation uh, for this winter. And uh, this is much smaller than the uh, 36 uh, existing nuclear reactors. So it's only nine out of 36. But this shows that in order to ensure that we have sufficient power supply and to reduce cost in face of the uh, global uh, uh, surge in the international energy prices, it is logical to use the existing nuclear reactors. Um, so I think there is a, not a consensus, but a strong support in using the existing nuclear reactors to first reopen them, restart them. But um, as Bob and Sherry said, mentioned, the next stage would be to extend uh, the operation lives of those nuclear reactors. The principle uh, in Japan, the rule is, the, is 40 years of operation. Uh, but we are in the process of trying to extend them to 60 years. So reopen and extending the operational lives of those nuclear reactors of the existing ones, I think there is a pretty much a reasonably strong support for this. The pace is slow, but we have a support. As for the uh, construction of new nuclear reactors, I, I would have to say that this is a, still a very divisive uh, issue in Japan. But uh, my personal view is that as many countries uh, like UK, France, or the East European countries are making their decision to introduce um, nuclear, uh, if we are serious uh, in order to, to realize carbon neutrality, and if we are serious in reducing our, uh, enhancing our uh, energy security, um, we cannot solely depend on the a prolonging of the uh, existing nuclear reactors. We have to start uh, constructing uh, new nuclear reactors in Japan. Um, this, but this is still a very uh, politically uh, divisive issues. Um, so th that, that is something that we have to tackle. Thank you. Sherry, we have two minutes. I'm going to okay. ask you to have the final word. All right. Well, I did. I mean, though, that was uh, excellent framing of, of the where we are, I think, on um, nuclear energy. Um, particularly in Japan and the case for uh, extending uh, existing power plants. Uh, I, I would observe that I think we are at a juncture now on nuclear where the new nuclear will not be only the large base load AP1000, the other pl plants that we've historically had that were, um, you know, resulted in the tragedy at Fukushima and other places, um, 
but you know we're we're developing a a new distributed small and modular nuclear power industry and micro react that will be used um, on a much smaller scale. I just note that I just saw this morning the Dow Chemical in the U.S. has invested with X Energy to build a small modular reactor uh, at one of its chemical facilities at a plant in the Gulf Coast uh, of the U.S. So I think what we're going to see now is the smaller modular reactors that are going to be used to power a plant, a substation, a, a, uh, a, a, military, a military base, for example. Uh, and they'll start in, you know, areas where there's the more remote or more politically acceptable, both in the U.S. and, and elsewhere that they deploy. And so I think, and I, I think in the last decade I observed in the U.S., we've kind of re, um, reassessed the, uh, some of the opposition that the U.S. faced also to um, advancing its own nuclear energy industry. And I think what's important now is, is we also have not only to address the safety uh, associated with nuclear, but it's in important critical role in a decarbonized society, but also thirdly and very important, the fact that if the US, Japan and, and Europe and other nations do not advance their own nuclear energy industry, we will cede this to the likes of Russia and China. And that is gonna be much to our detriment because their safety and non-proliferation standards are not always as high as ours. And I think that's important for us to lead and set the bar high on safety, non-proliferation, as well as um, uh, energy. So that's my, my closing comment. We have to address all of the challenges we face in an integrated way. And that's why the US-Japan relationship is so important and enduring across all the sectors we've discussed today from hydrogen, natural gas, um, nuclear, and the other renewable sectors. And I just want to thank you all for letting me be a part of this discussion. Um, this has been a really rich discussion, um, not just about energy security, but really about the opportunities um, for Japan and the United States to work more closely together on, on uh, security um, and, and some of the cross-border challenges uh, that the world is really facing today. And I really do want to thank you all um, for joining us today. And I hope that we can continue to have this conversation moving forward and inviting you back. Um, Terazawa-san, uh, Takamura-san, uh, thank you so much for um, joining us from Japan despite the time difference. Uh, Sherry, Bob, um, thank you for being here today. And of course, thank you all for logging in today to join this discussion. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very thank much. You, right, thank you, Sherry. Thank you very much. Very well moderated. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.